Thank you, thank you to our teens, our praise team, leading us. Some energetic songs there, so I already feel the energy is a little higher, and that's a, that's a good thing. How are we doing with my slides? Are they ready? Okay, just making sure. Father, as we continue in our worship, I just appeal to you today, Lord, that your voice would be heard in here, that our hearts would be touched and moved uh, as we study your word and as we contemplate uh, the passages and the stories that we look at today. Lord, we just want your name to be honored and glorified. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I uh, spoke on the last battle, talked about Armageddon, uh, of all things, looking at that passage in Revelation that talks about the final battle, the final struggle, what it means, especially in context with so much of the anxiety and angst about what's going on in the Middle East and with the modern day nation of Israel and all the interpretation and, and prophecy that people uh, sometimes associate with that. And we looked at that from a biblical perspective and tried to put it in context. In a way, today's message is kind of a part two to that. We left off with Armageddon and talked about how that's a spiritual battle primarily. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a real uh, conflict element to it, but primarily it's a spiritual battle between the forces of the devil and God and God's people, and that it is the battle of the great day of God. It will be over the convictions and the commandments associated with the Sabbath day as well. And so we looked at all that as we were developing a, a biblical understanding or delving into a biblical understanding of Armageddon and looking at the bull, um, the bull judgments or bull plagues of Revelation 16. So we're going to just uh, dovetail a little bit in with that today. And there is kind of a, a, uh, an element of this that will also uh, trickle into next week too because next week is Veterans Day on Sabbath, uh, November the 11th. And so um, there will be a, a little bit of a tie-in with that as well. So we don't have many kids here, so I, I try to remember to retitle my interactive uh, quiz time in the beginning when it's children's church. So instead of a kid's quiz, I call it a teen trivia. And um, my son isn't here. Is the red mic a good mic, Daniel? Is that a lot of power in the red mic? Good. Oh, so we got Dean Mark and uh, George and, and, and Black. I'd love to have some of our young people. This is for, open for any of our young people here. I call it teen trivia because most of our kids are in the uh, fellowship hall. Uh, the voice of the crane is my title, and it's going to be on this idea of voices. And, of course, we're going to talk about God's voice. How powerful is God's voice? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, something that God has said in the Bible, and you tell me how his power is shown in what he said. He said at one point, let there be light. How, what was God doing in that moment? Was he just saying, hey, flip on the switch on the wall, it's a little dark. Or what was he doing to show his power when he said, let there be light? Raise your hand, Vitor, I see you over there. I know you're here, man. You can jump in. Any of our teens, have you read the Bible? Is this something we've done before? And are, just joking. What was God doing when he said, let there be light? This isn't meant to be tricky. I, I feel like there's confusion going on here. Oh, Nico, you're so helpful. Thank you. He was commanding. Commanding what? He's commanding um, the universe. Okay. Is he right? Yes, he was showing his power of creation. When God said, let there be light, what happened? There was Light. You want to know why God can't lie? You know why God can't lie? Because whenever he says something, it comes true. If God was to say, uh, tigers don't have stripes. Now that's incorrect, right? But if God said it, guess what? Tigers wouldn't have stripes. Because when God says it, it is true. It happens. Now I'm being, you know, embellishing. I'm face being facetious. Don't write me emails after this, okay, and be all tough on me, but you know what I'm saying. When God speaks, it happens. Okay, next one. He said, hush, be still. What was he doing when he said, hush, be still? Do you remember your Bible stories? 
Hush, be so. Oh, Mackenzie, thank you. Uh, he was calming a storm. You got it right. That's right. We do have a couple of good Bible teachers here, Dean Mark. They're teaching <laughs> these kids good stuff. You know, in, in actuality, when Jesus said, hush, be still, it's more likely that he did this. Shh. There was really no Greek word or way of translating it, but from the flow of the story and from what it seems to be revealed in the scriptures, Jesus probably didn't speak words. He probably just went, shh. Sometimes you'll see the story that Jesus stood up on the prow of the boat and he yelled to the storm, be quiet. Probably not. He probably just went, shh. And yet it was enough that the storm said, okay. And it went still. That's what the power of God's voice has. All right. Lazarus, come forth. Was he inviting him over for dinner? Lazarus, come in inside and sit down. We're going to have a meal. Lazarus, what was God doing with his voice when he said, Lazarus, come forth? I'll give you a hint. We actually sang about it in one of the songs. Do you remember that? His name was actually there. All right, what was he doing? Was it when he resurrected Re Nazareth? Or it no, no, was. No. It was very good. Spoken with conviction. Wasn't it? No, it was. <laughs> yes, and it's funny thing too is, is um, some people have said if Jesus hadn't identified Lazarus, if he just looked at the two and said, okay, arise or come forth, everyone would have arisen, right? As a matter of fact, all of the resurrections of Jesus, he always identifies. He says, little girl, I say to you, arise. And then with the, the widow of Nain, he puts his hand on the coffin. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. He has to limit it because the power of God's voice is so powerful that if he didn't identify as Lazarus, not everybody, not everybody, I'm only talking to Lazarus here. Everyone else, you stay in the tomb. But Lazarus, come forth. And you know what? Lazarus heard Jesus even though he was dead. And Lazarus came forth. Is that a powerful voice? That's a powerful voice. Next one. Be cleansed, you dishes. Yes. <laughs> be cleansed, you dirty laundry. What was Jesus talking about when he said, be cleansed? What was he talking about? Come on, I need some help. Any young people? See, they're just, it's. <laughs> Malcolm, are you helping us out here today? Yeah, Malcolm's helping us out. Try to think of it. Be cleansed. Just give it a try. You'll do, you'll do well. Wait. Um, no, this, you got it. No, no, no. Okay. Be this is when he healed the paralytic and he said, you're forgiven of your sins. That was horrible. I can't even believe you said that. <laughs> that was bad. That's so bad. wrong. No. You're close, though. You're close. Taylor. When he healed the man of leprosy? Oh, we got it. We got a winner. We got a winner. It was in the context of healing, though, Malcolm. Half credit. Half credit for that. Taylor. Yes. So Jesus actually cleanses someone from leprosy. He does many miracles, you remember, in the context of healing. But to cleanse someone from leprosy was one of the more desperate. Leprosy was the symbol of the absolute corruption of the flesh and the rejection of God. It wasn't like he had a sprained ankle or, you know, he had a, some minor little, uh, you know, cold or anything like that. To be healed from leprosy was really the depth of, of, of death. You were like the walking dead if you had leprosy. So it was highly significant. With the power of his voice, Jesus spoke and a person was cleansed, and, and these are wonderful. Okay, another one. Be quiet. You know, I was taught when I was growing up, you don't say shut up, right? Any of you grow up that way? You weren't supposed to say shut up. That was, no, you don't say that. So Jesus did not say shut up, but he said, be quiet. <laughs> Pretty close to shut up. What was he saying? And you know, this isn't the typical behavior of the gentle Jesus we like to think of. So what was he doing when he told someone or something to be quiet? What was the power of his voice doing in this story? Anyone? Because I got all day, guys. We can be, I'm fine. We can be here all day. Oh, now oh, Nico's like, okay, pastor, we got to get this thing moving. Give me, come on, let's hear it. Uh, when he was in the temple and he was flipping the tables over? Maybe. No. <laughs> oh, Malcolm. 
Gonna help us out, Malcolm? No, no, too late. Is it when he was talking to Peter? And he said, get behind me, Satan? No. <laughs> no. Be quiet. Who was he trying to silence? Why would Jesus want to silence anyone unless they were a pretty bad kind of demonic? Oh. I, was about to, I was about to say that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was what? saying <laughs> when he, wait, cast the demons out oh, of somebody. Oh, got it. Yep. Yes, you had it all along. Yes, Jesus doesn't use this you know, casually, it was when he was silencing demons. Be quiet and come out. Be quiet and come out of that. So that when Jesus spoke, did the demon say, uh-uh, I'm going to do what I want. You don't get to tell me what to do. Or what did the demon do? It obeyed. It obeyed. Hallelujah. When Jesus speaks, even the demons obey. All right, last one. Did Jesus speak the words, it is finished? Was there power in that message? What was Jesus saying when he said, it is finished? Hi, Jalen. Thank you so much. Uh, when he died on the cross. When he died on the cross. And what was finished? <laughs> and the sacrifices. Then, uh, yeah. Well, the having to sacrifice things in order for our sins to be forgiven. So the, the penalty of sin. And? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I, I, I appreciate it. We, I just call, he, he completes the plan of salvation. When he said it is finished, thank you, George. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for our young people for indulging in the teen trivia. When God speaks, there is power. When the Lord Jesus uses his voice, by his voice, his power over all things is manifested. By his word, all creation has its being. Now, we are made in the image of God. Our voice, our words have power. Our voice, our words changes things. It affects things. We are creative. If you go around telling someone that they're valued, that they're loved, that they are important, that creates a reality in their life. And to the same, as, to the same degree, it's the opposite. If you go around telling someone that they're undervalued, that they're a loser, that they're a nobody, you know, you all grew up, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Why do we lie to our children? Why do we do that? Now, of course, we need to learn to develop, you know, a, a resistance and thick skin, but words have power. And the Word of God, if our words have power, how much power does God's voice and God's Word have? That's what we're looking at. Now, Psalm 39, 33, verse 9, for He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now, this is Mostly a reference to God's creation. This is one of the create, uh, creation psalms. But it has a broader meaning and implication as well. When God speaks whatever it is, it is done. He spoke and it was done. Keep that in your head. He spoke and it was done. Revelation 16, verses 17 and following. The seventh angel poured out, poured out his bowl upon the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. The Lord spoke and it was done. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. This is the voice of God saying, it is done. This is right after Armageddon. This is right after Revelation 16, verses 16, when it says, and they gathered them together for the great battle of Armageddon. And in the midst of this, the seventh angel pours out his bowl. And right at the midst of this great battle at the end of time, God intervenes with his voice. He doesn't intervene with his armies. He intervenes with his voice. And he says, with my voice, it is done. And then the rest of 
that uh, uh, passage in Revelation goes on to describe the destruction of the earth, very much like when Peter says that the coming of the Lord, the elements will melt and all the earth and everything in it will be destroyed. This is the end. Just as God created the world with His voice and with His word and with His power, so also will God end the world, the world as we know it, with His voice and with His word and with His power. Armageddon ends when God's voice erupts from heaven and declares it is done. Now, this is not new to the thinking of Revelation because all throughout the Bible, dozens and dozens and dozens of places, I'm just going to show you a few, it had always been through the prophets and through the scriptures that God had always said, it will be with my voice that the end will come. The Lord roars from Zion, Joel says. He utters his voice from Jerusalem. And what happens? This isn't God just speaking and, and declaring his law. No, no, no. The heavens and the earth tremble. The Lord thundered in the heavens. The Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire come in, as he utters his voice in the last days and at the end. Psalm 46, the nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. All of these scriptures talking about this event that takes place in, there in Revelation chapter 16. To him who rides upon the highest heavens, behold, he speaks forth with his voice, a mighty voice. The Lord roars from Zion. You know, all this talking about roaring, the loudest sound known to humanity in the ancient world was the roar of a lion. The roar of a lion. He, the Lord roars from Zion and from Jerusalem. He utters his voice, and the summit of Carmel dries up. That uh, Carmel where Elijah fought with the prophets of Baal. That same result, the judgment of God, the fire of God consuming the sacrifice. Jeremiah 25, the Lord will roar from on high. By the way, when this happens, how many people are not going to hear it? Is the, the idea of the silent coming of the Lord is, is just not uh, uh, appropriate or biblical. He does certain things uh, privately, of course, but all of the scriptures consistently, when the Lord comes, when the Lord ends the great controversy, it will come with a shout, with a roar. He will utter his voice. He will roar mightily. He will shout. All those are Old Testament. Just a couple of verses from the New. We remember this one from Thessalonians. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a... Oh, is there some people out listening. Thank you. You didn't shout it, but you did say it. Thank you. The Lord will come from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. And again, it's so loud, even the dead hear it. And they come up out of their graves. And Jesus and John, or in John 5, don't marvel. An hour is coming when not just Lazarus, not just the little girl, not just the, 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 the uh, son of the widow of Nain, but when all who are in the tombs, will hear the voice. He has a voice that even the dead will hear it. This all throughout the Bible. But the interesting thing is, in all these verses that tell us that in the end, God will utter His voice. God will share His voice. He's going to roar. He's going to shout. It will wake the very dead. But in all of those verses, none of them said what God will say. until you get to Revelation 16. Revelation 16 gives us the words that God will shout. Revelation 16 gives us the message that will be the roar. And what is it? It is done. Now, now hear me, I'm not saying that it's these exact words. I mean, Revelation is filled with symbolism and analogy. It might be the sentiment that the war is over. It is done. The mystery of iniquity has been completed. The great controversy has ended. Righteousness by faith has won. The sentiment of it is done is what the message of Jesus Christ will be when He returns to the earth. But here in Revelation, in the bold judgments, after the battle, or in the midst of the battle of Armageddon, we might say, to end the battle of Armageddon, God breaks forth with His voice and says, Enough! It is done. The war 
is over. The war that started in heaven with the rebellion of Lucifer, the war that continued on earth with the fall of Adam and Eve, the war that has been churning in the midst of our world from that time until now. God breaks forth and he says, I will not allow this to continue any longer. There is nothing left necessary and it is done. Now, all throughout the Bible, God uses history and, again, metaphor and analogy to teach us lessons. He uses in prophecy the fall of Jerusalem as examples of what we can expect in the last days, the fall of Babylon and the rise and fall of other nations. I want to I uh, use an analogy now from history to illustrate kind of what this circumstance uh, looks like and will look like in the last days and what we can learn of it. Now, if I was to go back in time and think of the, the, the last war or the last experience that we've had as, a, uh, a, a, as humanity that most closely resembles the final ultimate battle, I would have to go further back than Desert Storm, further back than Vietnam, further back than Korea. I would have to go all the way back to World War II because really there's no conflict that compares with the devastation and the reality of the brutality of war other than World War II. On September 2nd, 1945, 10 diplomats representing the Allied and, and the nations that were at war still in the Pacific gathered on board the USS Missouri. This was to be the final formal completion of World War II. This event was steeped in ceremony and symbolism right from the beginning. It was brief. It only took 23 minutes, but it was tense and it was filled with all kinds of drama. The very ship that they went on, the USS Missouri, was the ship built by the United States specifically to get revenge for Pearl Harbor. It was not a, an accidental choice. Over 300 Allied vessels came into Tokyo Bay on September 2nd and stationed themselves. The Missouri was, was placed there and the, the uh, representatives of Japan at 9 o'clock in the morning ferry out to the USS Missouri. The Missouri was named for Harry S. Truman's home state, christened by his daughter, Margaret. And it was Truman who made the decision to drop the atomic bombs. All of this was, again, highly symbolic and significant that the Japanese would have to board. They didn't have to do it this way. They did it this way on purpose, right or wrong. So the diplomats board the USS Missouri. And there were no salutes. There were no surrendering of sabers. There were no overt actions of honor, nor demands of humiliation, which are all very strange for such a ceremony like this. When the Japanese surrendered in, in, in other places, all those things took place, not on the Missouri. Um, one of the diplomats here, uh, his name is Toshikuzu Casey. He was just a young man. He's 42. I, I can say that now. Uh, 42 is young. It feels young to me. Is that okay? Um, he spoke afterwards and he said, never have I understood how painful the glance of glaring eyes can be. He said, we stood there like penitent schoolboys awaiting the dreaded schoolmaster. Now, the Allies were very nervous at this time. If you had been at Iwo Jima, if you had been at Okinawa, if you had been on a ship that had been attacked by kamikazes, you would be nervous too. 800, 800 Allied planes at this time were sitting on runways and aircraft carriers with their engines running, waiting to see if there would be some kind of treachery at this event. Observing the skies, people at their machine gun turrets. They didn't know what the Japanese were doing because they were fighting till the very end in desperate measures all throughout these battles. So they expected and anticipated that there could be something happening at this event. Shigematsu was the first to sign. He was the foreign minister of Japan during uh, this part of the war. They went through several during the war. Um, one of the uh, m main individuals that helped bring Japan to peace was Shigematsu. And there's uh, Toshikuzu again, um, the young man who I quoted from earlier. I believe that's Nimitz. I have not figured that out yet. By the way, this entire experience was videographed, or excuse me, videotaped in color at the time 
But that video was not released until 2010. Up until 2010, all we had were photographs and audio files of this event. So the Japanese sign, all the other allied nations signed the articles and instruments of surrender. Um, MacArthur, there's old <laughs> curmudgeon Douglas MacArthur. The Navy was very upset that an army man was cho chosen to be supreme commander uh, when the Navy was a lot more involved in most of the military conflicts with Japan. But needless to say, Truman put MacArthur uh, in charge of the event. Again, this is, this is extremely filled, again, with all kinds. Of, and I could take all day talking about all of the other symbolism and, and things with this. After the signing of the Articles of Surrender, though, MacArthur came to a microphone. He makes several speeches, uh, short speeches during this, but he makes his final speech, and this is just a portion of it, and he begins with the words, today the guns are silent. A great tragedy has ended, and we have had our last chance. If we do not now devise some greater and more equitable system, our Magadon, he doesn't call it our he pronounces it, our Magadon will be at our door. He literally references Armageddon at the signing of the treaty and surrender of Japan. Now, all of what happened on September 2nd, this is the formal ending. There will be skirmishes and, and other things that happen, obviously, that take place in war. This was the formal end of World War II. But all of what happened on September 2nd 1945 could not and would not have happened if it had not been for the voice of the crane. The crane was the imperial symbol of the emperor and the palace. And the Showa emperor, Hirohito, who sat on the throne during the war, was the one who is the voice of the crane. The longest single, singular monarchy in history is the Japanese. They still have a monarch on their throne now. For over 2,000 years, you can trace the heritage of the dynasty of the monarchies of Japan. It is very controversial what happened with Hirohito. We do not know to what it, to this day. He died in 89. He was never tried as a war criminal. To this day, we do not know the extent of his knowledge of the atrocities of the Japanese in China or other places, or his ability to stop or prevent them. But what we do know for sure about Hirohito is what he did to help stop the war. Oh, just a few more things that's important to know. Hirohito was a god to the Japanese. They believed him to be a divine being, not in the way that we do in the West, not the type of divine being like God in a supernatural and eternal. In the Shinto philosophy and religion of the Japanese, the emperor was the culmination of all the ancestral nobility and the, and the national essence of the Japanese people. But they worshipped him as a god. They referred to him as a god. They believed he was too holy for the average person to look on. His pictures were everywhere, but no one was allowed to look. You could never look Hirohito in the eye. You were not allowed to hear his voice. His voice was too holy. He was, he was raised in a, a kind of a hermit environment um, and, sh and sheltered from the average Japanese because they believed he was divine. He was a poet and a marine biologist. From August the 6th to August the 9th, 200,000 Japanese died, mostly from the two atomic bombs. August 6th, Hiroshima is incinerated. Over 80,000 people disappeared in a flash. Tens of thousands more days, weeks, months, and years later from radiation. Three days later, on August 9th, 65,000, mostly Christians, by the way. The Center for Christianity in Japan was Nagasaki on Kyoto. Did you know that? 65,000 Japanese disappeared in an instant. In the in-between days, conventional bombing and the fire bombing of Tokyo, 200,000 died. 
Japan is still at war, and they're not ready to give up even after these tremendous losses. Their uh, samurai Bushido code said, you never surrender. At midnight on August 9th, the ministers of Japan gather in the palace, and they try to decide what to do. On that very same day, August 9th, Russia, or the USA, USSR declares war on Japan as well. They had, up to this point, not been uh, engaged in conflict with Japan. But on August 9th, um, they also declare war on Japan. So at midnight, on August 9th, the leaders of Japan gather with the emperor, and they sit down to decide, what do we do? There had already been a, an offering of surrender coming from the Allies called, called the Potsdam Declaration. And they were trying to decide, do we accept that or not? There were six individuals that had power to make decisions. Three of them said, we're going to continue the war, even if it means the extinction of the Japanese people. They were literally training civilians with bamboo sticks to repel the Allied invasion that was going to come to the mainland of Japan. But three said, no, no, we cannot do this. We cannot sacrifice the lives of every Japanese we need to accept the Potsdam Declaration. So they were tied, three to three. And then the emperor, who at these meetings never spoke, the emperor spoke. And I'm not trying to exonerate or make a hero out of Hirohito. Don't misunderstand me. But on this moment, he spoke. And you want to know what he said? It is done. He said, I believe that the allies are honest in their offering of surrender and their uh, humanitarian offers to the Japanese people. And I wish for all of you to agree with me to accept the terms of surrender. The Japanese that were in favor of continuing the war hated it. They pled with him, but he said, no, you must agree with me. It is done. So they had to figure out, how do we tell a hundred million Japanese that we're doing something that the Japanese people never do? I mean, anyone ever heard of samurai before? Okay. In the Japanese culture, if a samurai loses, they're beheaded. In Japanese culture, and again, this is a, I'm not saying this is good, bad, or anything, uh, you, you remember how many ritual suicides the Japanese were doing? Because in their mindset, in their worldview, you cannot surrender. And so they had a problem. How do we tell a hundred million Japanese who have never understood the principle or philosophy of giving up or surrendering, these people who literally are dying on beaches and using uh, uh, bamboo sticks and rocks, that they're going to surrender? And they finally came to the, the decision, we're going to have to do something We've never done before. You're, Hirohito, you're going to have to speak to the people. Now, I wish, again, I could give you all the drama between August 9th and August 15 of all the things that were going on, the chaos that was taking place in Japan and among the allies during this time. But to, be, uh, to sum it up, Hirohito records a message at the radio station. He records it twice. And by the way, this is the type of poet that he was. He knew that the message was going to go out on August 15th, okay? So he made sure the message had 815 characters. It, it's just part of the, uh, the, again, the symbolism. He records the message. The first times he recorded it, his voice had never been recorded before, except for accident when he was like 15 years old, when he was like 50 feet away and a microphone accidentally caught his voice. Other than that, his voice had never been recorded. Keep in mind, the Japanese had never heard the voice of their God before. But they were willing to die for that God. So he records the message, and the first time he recorded it, he said, no, we can't do this. I made three mistakes. I can't, we, we need to record it again. So they made a second recording, and that's the recording that they announced on August 15th. At 9 o'clock in the morning, a message went out to all Japanese stations, be ready for a message from the emperor at noon. So they had three hours warning. So at noon on August 15th, 1945, the Japanese people 
heard the voice of their God for the very first time. They gathered in town centers and in schoolyards, the youth centers, neighborhoods gathered around transistors, even in POW camps. This one's in Guam. A hundred million Japanese, for the most part, gathered round to hear their God's voice, the voice of the crane. And what did they hear? Was it a voice of victory? Was it a voice that we've won? Was it a message of, of success? It was not. It was a voice that said, we lost. And it's interesting, John Tolan writes about this in one of his great anthologies about it. He said, perhaps at no other time in history have more people simultaneously began to weep than at 12 noon on August 15th 1945, because a hundred million Japanese fell to their knees and began to weep when they heard the voice of their God. Now, we're going to try something. I, I realize this is going to be a little wonky, but this, this moment is so important in history. I want you to hear a portion of Hirohito speaking on August 15th, 1945. So if our audio team is ready, go ahead and play that now. We're not going to listen. It's about five minutes long. We're just going to listen for a minute or two. Or maybe one second. The drama builds. に その共同宣言を受託する旨通告に帝国の自尊と法案の安定と初期数にて他国の主権を廃止共同国産語時は元より金が殺しにあらず力に公選戦期待を決めし金が一回消費の多い戦金が一回消費の多い戦金が一回消費の多い戦金が一回消費の多
uh, unprecedented thing when he spoke to his people. Now, the thing, this to me is just a very, uh, you know, historically significant, but also just dripping in, in irony as well. We don't have to wait for us in our battle at the very end to hear God's voice. And when we do hear God's voice, His voice is not going to be one that says, you've lost. It's all been in vain. We're surrendering. We're giving in. The enemy is going to come occupy. As tragic as the series of events were of World War II and as important was the end of the war and the contribution of those that were involved in ending it, the voice of the crane was a voice of despair. But the voice of God that we will hear at the end will not be one of surrender. It will be one of victory. Amen? And unlike the Japanese, we can hear God's voice today. Revelation, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had been, what's the word? Victorious. People that get fearful or they worry about what is it going to be like in those last days when all of the world is at war, when all people are opposed to us, when all of my values are being challenged, when every decision I make is being judged, when everything is against me, how will I know that God is for me? He is speaking to us with His voice, that powerful voice that can raise the dead. He is speaking in that voice today. We can hear the voice of God today because we hold it in our hands every time we hold the Word of God. It may not be an audible voice coming across a radio. It may not be a booming voice coming out of the clouds on Mount Sinai. It might not be the pleasant voice of Jesus Christ at the Sermon on the Mount, but no less powerful, no less significant, no less victorious, no less important is God's Word that we hold in our hand. You want to know how we're going to make it through Armageddon? You want to know how we're going to understand and recognize the voice of God? Is if we have His Word living and active and alive in our hearts now. My sheep hear my voice. The Word of God is living and active. In the Psalms it says, I have taken your Word and I've treasured, I've hid it in my heart that I might not sin against you. Seven times in the Gospel, Jesus says, if you have an ear, then you can hear. And then seven times again in Revelation, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God is speaking now. And only those that are listening now, only those that are obeying now, only those that are recognizing God's voice now will have the clarity and wisdom and, and relationship with God that will give us the endurance so that we won't have to endure what's unendurable. And so that we won't have to suffer what is insufferable. But we will be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Babylon. We'll be able to stand against the lions. We'll be able to go into the fiery furnace and not be afraid. He who has an ear, let him hear. The voice of God speaks today. Are you listening? Are you taking advantage in your Bible studies, in your prayer and meditation, in your journaling, in your Sabbath school, in your worship service, in your music, in your family conversations? Are you listening to God's voice? He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the sheep of His hand. Today. 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 If you would but hear His voice. Are we a people of the Word? Are we a people who listens to the voice of God? Will we be ready for that voice in the last days when out of the temple, from the throne, we hear a familiar voice of our God? 
saying, It is done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Pray with me. Lord, in just a small way, trying to draw together historical realities and experiences that can illustrate to us some of these dramatic events, Father, we've journeyed through this moment in prophecy and in the Bible of what the experience of your people will be and what the challenges we may face in the last days. But Lord, we do not need to have fear. You have proven yourself over and over and over again that your word is powerful, that your voice can sustain us. You have given us your word. You've given us Jesus who was the Word of God. And you have shown that you will deliver your people despite all the, all of the world uniting against us. You will speak and your voice is powerful and your voice will save us. God, help us to apply this to our lives. Help us not to neglect listening to your voice today. Help us to get to know your voice today. Help us to be familiar with the voice of God ringing in our hearts, ringing in our faith, steadfast in our conviction. Lord, we need this. We need it today, even though we don't face these trials, but we still need it today, so we'll be ready when those trials do come. Thank you. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for being our God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.